very full show today. Very full show today. Two top Xfinity Series contenders got into an all-out brawl this past weekend. TV ratings for Kansas were way up, and Stuart Haas Racing's got some silly season drama that we've got to talk about. Full show ahead. Let's do it. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Yeah, I'm excited for this episode, midweek edition of the show. I've got a lot of things to talk about, but before I get to all the nitty gritty, all the juicy details and everything, we've got to thank today's sponsor, Forney Industries, once again, a huge partner of the show here of Out of the Groove, a leader of the welding and metalworking industry, one of America's longest running family owned businesses. They sell over 5,000 metalworking products. Forney Industries is your one stop shop for all your do it yourself, industrial, automotive, and hardware needs. And as they've been doing pretty much every Every week of these playoffs on this show, Forney Industries is hosting another awesome Forney product giveaway. You can check out the link down in the description. It'll take you to their Twitter giveaway. Get a load of this week's awesome giveaway pack. They're giving away an awesome welding helmet, welding gloves, pliers, magnets, perfect starter pack for any new welders out there. Super easy to enter. Just check out that link down in the description. A huge thank you again to Forney Industries for sponsoring Out of the Groove and sponsoring today's episode. All right, so how should we start this episode? It's a very busy episode. Usually I would say the biggest story, the thing I have the most to say about, I'd save that for the end of the show. Kind of dangle it at the end like a little carrot on a stick, put it at the end. But I think in today's episode, we're gonna go in chronological order. And so I'm gonna start with the biggest story because it happened earlier this weekend. It happened on Saturday at the end of the Xfinity race at Kansas. There was a fight. One thing's for sure about fights in NASCAR, drivers almost never win, but the fans pretty much always do. This one, however, was a doozy. This was a heavyweight bout, not because either of these guys are particularly particularly large or physically imposing or anything like that, but two of the top contenders, two championship contenders on two of the top race teams in the Xfinity Series went at it on pit road after the race on Saturday. And I'm going to give you guys some of my reactions to it because NASCAR revealed earlier this week, yesterday, that there will be no penalties as a result of this fight. Here's a quick clip of the fight. I like how Tyler Rex just standing around at first like he doesn't want any trouble and then Custer comes over and then they get into it. Then the crew guys pile in. At the end of this fight, Reddick had some scrapes on his face it looked like. Ultimately, not too much harm was done from this fight, but it raised the question, should NASCAR team of crew members and so on get involved in these fights? When two drivers start going at it on pit road or wherever after a race or before a race, after qualifying as we've seen this year, should the crew guys get involved or should the drivers just settle it out amongst themselves? Maybe the NASCAR officials give them something to do. They go over there and break it up. How should it work? Should crew guys get involved in these fights? Like I said, NASCAR did not penalize, did not fine, did not suspend anyone for their role in that fight Saturday afternoon. And I have a slight problem with that personally. I think when two drivers start the fight, if a driver goes up to another driver and pu pushes him, punches him, however it goes, if the two drivers alone start the fight, the pit crew guys should more or less go hands off with it. I think if the crew guys are going to get involved in the fight in any way, they should not be there to escalate it further. They should be there to de-escalate the fight, if nothing else. It's fully there just to break it up. My problem here is when Cole Custer went up to Tyler Reddick and grabbed him, and then Reddick grabbed him back, and they started grappling with each other for a moment there, and didn't really throw any punches, didn't even really shove each other, just kind of held each other really tough on their shoulders. Immediately, I didn't like that two or three SHR guys swarmed Reddick, and at least one guy, looks like they just grabbed him around the head and neck area and kind of pulled him down to the ground. I don't like that at all. I don't like that multiple Stuart Haas crew guys went up to Reddick and forced him to the ground by grabbing him up in this area. That is, that was a major red flag. I thought they should have been fined or something for that. If Custer had gotten Reddick around the neck or gotten him in a chokehold and gotten him on the ground, okay, yeah, maybe a NASCAR official should get in there and start breaking that up. But the fact that it was a one-on-one -on -one fight and then it quickly became a four-on-one -on fight where three crew guys were grabbing Reddick in the head and neck area, putting him on the ground, that I didn't like at all. I thought that was too far, and that's why I don't think crew guys should get involved in fights like this, because it took a while for RCR dudes to get over there, and when they finally did get over there, they didn't really do anything. It reminds me of the Gordon Keslowski incident in Texas. It always bothered me. You look at this clip, you know, Gordon starts the fight with Keslowski, and then all of a sudden, a Gordon crew guy just sneak attacks Keslowski, grabs him by the head and neck, and pulls him down. Like, that's a super cheap shot by that Jeff Gordon crew guy. That was a super cheap shot. I thought he should have been fined for that. He might have been. I honestly don't remember. I doubt he was, but he might have been. And he should have been. Fight was between Gordon and Keselowski, and the fact that a Jeff Gordon crew member just went around, and that's, that's not cool at all. That's similar, in my opinion, to what happened to Reddick here. And that's why I think crew guys... Just looking at these two incidents specifically, I think those are reasons why crew guys should not get involved in these fights. And if they are gonna get involved, it should be purely to de-escalate the situation. That's not what these crew guys were doing here. They were furthering the situation by getting their opposing driver on the ground. Like if Custer can't get Reddick on the ground, crew guys should not be putting Reddick on the ground. That is too far in my opinion, so 
That's all I really have to say about that. I think if two drivers get in a fight, let the officials handle it. Let the NASCAR officials handle it. Give them something else to do so they're not just sitting there staring at lug nuts for 30 minutes because that's all they're doing right then. They're just looking at lug nuts. I'm sure they'd love to break up a fight. I bet that'd be more fun than staring at lug nuts. So let, let the NASCAR officials separate these fights. I don't want to see four on one because a bunch of crew guys decided to come in and grab a guy by his neck and head area. That's not cool. I didn't like that at all. That being said, wow, talk about drama. Talk about an endorsement for your playoff system when you've got two of the heavyweight drivers, two of the Homestead Championship favorites, physically fighting with just three weeks to go in the season. Like, that is wow. That'd be like game one of the World Series. Astros and Nationals completely dogpile each other on, at midfield and then afterwards say bad things about each other's moms. Oh my gosh, MLB ratings for game two would be through the roof. So I'm excited what this is going to bring for uh, Texas and going forward the Xfinity Series. This has added a new layer of drama to what was otherwise, in my opinion, kind of a dry playoff battle. You got three heavyweights over there. You got their own big three over there. Kind of, you know, they're all good drivers. They're going to be really entertaining, but all kind of dry. This added a lot of personality to that Xfinity Series championship battle. So I am here for it. Just don't want the crew guys getting involved like that. That That's too far in my opinion. Now speaking of TV ratings, NBC reportedly saw 3.32 million viewers for this Sunday's Cup Series race at Kansas, a 20% increase from the same race last year. Both Kansas races, same spot on the schedule, both run on Sunday on the main NBC network, and this year's race saw a 20% increase. That is a, that's hundreds of thousands of people we're talking about here. That is a major increase year over year. It kind of came out of nowhere. I think I think there's really only two possible reasons that can explain why this race saw a sudden random jump in ratings. First and foremost, that's the 2019 Aero Package, man. First race at Kansas in the spring was really freaking fun to watch. I think most fans agreed who watched that race agreed that it was a thriller for much of it. It was one of the races, it was kind of a night race, cooler temperatures. It was a race where this package shined brightest. It was one of its brightest spots of the season. Uh, three, four, five wide racing, great battles for the lead pretty much all night long. This weekend's race, this uh, fall race, was not as entertaining. It was still an okay race, had some fun finishes, had some good playoff drama, but still a solid race. But I think it was the success of the spring race. I think the fact that that one was such an exciting race, it turned out to be such a fun race to watch, I think that brought in some new fans to this one. 20%, did it bring in hundreds of thousands of fans? No, there's no way it was responsible for all of that growth, but it was responsible for some of it. And then the second reason, honestly, I think NASCAR's partnership, or what started out as a partnership with Barstool Sports, has blossomed into something actually really good for NASCAR. I'm not a Barstool fan. I'm not super familiar with their brand or their their everything or their entity, but I know they've become a huge player in NASCAR in 2019. Obviously, I think it's pretty clear. NASCAR paid uh, the head of Barstool. They paid Dave Portnoy to go to the Daytona 500 and talk good about NASCAR. That's clear. I think that's clear as day. But since then, Dave's been to a few other races. He's gotten the Barstool audience excited about NASCAR. And now he's sponsoring Matt DiBenedetto. And we saw last weekend at Talladega when he was on Matt DiBenedetto's car for that race, we saw big streaming uh, increasing numbers. I don't want to say the barstool effect is a major factor. I don't want to say that it's like completely reinvigorated the sport or anything like that, but I think he has moved. They, they have moved the dial just a little bit. They have moved the needle just a tad in NASCAR's favor. So I think whoever at NASCAR was responsible for making that partnership happen, I think it was a great move. I think it was genius. I think that had a small factor probably in the increase in ratings here at Kansas, but 20%, man, that just... I don't know where that came from. That's crazy. This was NBC's highest rated NASCAR race since Homestead last year, the finale. So not a bad weekend to be a NASCAR fan. Increased ratings are always a good thing. When you're still drawing in 3.3 million viewers for a mile and a half race in the middle of football season, your sport's doing just fine. Obviously, you could do better. You need to be doing that every week, but the fact that we're still able to do that from time to time, still good news. So uh, let's take and run with it. Last bit of news I want to talk about today. We got to talk a little bit about silly season stuff because Stuart Haas Racing is the one big team that's got most of their contracts locked down, but there's a couple names still floating around. We've already talked about Cole Custer. Now we're going to talk about him in regards to his future plans. So Adam Stern from Sports Business Journal tweeted that Corey LaJoy, he believes, is likely to stay at Go Fast Racing for 2020. Now the rumors for a while now have suggested that Go Fast Racing is interested in strengthening their alliance with Stuart Haas Racing so that that 32 would have a little bit more of a technical alliance with one of the heavyweight mothership teams in this sport. That would obviously improve the performance from Go Fast Racing and if Corey LaJoy does stay in the 32, which I think would be great because I think he is consistently outrun his 
his equipment a little bit this year. Uh, I think that's big news for LaJoy's future and for that team's future if they want to ever be actually competitive in NASCAR. Right now, they're just a notch above a start and park team, really. They, you know, they finish all the laps every week, and occasionally, like we saw at Talladega, they're able to run with the big boys, but they don't have the resources that the big teams do or even the middle-sized teams do. So to get this alliance, if that does happen, if they get an alliance with SHR, strengthen their technical relationship, that could be big news for not just the 32, but also for Corey LaJoy. Now, if Corey LaJoy doesn't go to that 32 car, there have been rumors that Cole Custer could be tapped to drive the 32 car if they do become an SHR line team. But according to Adam Stern's tweet, it now seems a little bit more likely that LaJoy will stay in the 32. So what does that mean for Cole Custer? Because the main SHR team has their lineup pretty, pretty much locked down. Harvick, Boyer, and Amarola are all under contract through at least 2020. Daniel Suarez is really Cole Custer's last shot at landing a cup ride for next year. Daniel Suarez in the 41 this year does not have a contract for 2020, and from the sounds of it, they're currently, like literally this week from what I can tell, are in negotiations with sponsors to see if he will stay in the 41 for 2020. Now, last year, I feel like it was kind of a lock. I know he didn't get that deal done until mid-January, but once he finally did, I feel like we we're like, okay, we knew this was coming. Took them a while, but we knew it was coming. Suarez has a deep relationship with Eris. That's the main sponsor he brought from Gibbs over to SHR. However, even with that money behind him, it took until mid-January for them to get a contract for this year. So that makes it seem to me like maybe that relationship that Suarez and Eris have together isn't as strong, isn't as tight as it once was. Because that's the truth of it. Suarez's future with Stuart Haas Racing is entirely dependent on Eris money. Does he get enough funding from Eris for Tony Stewart and Gene Haas to say it's worthwhile putting Suarez in that car? And that's kind of sad, but it's the truth because performance-wise, Daniel Suarez has done nothing in his cup career to prove that he deserves a championship contending car like that 41 is. So it's purely dependent on if he can find the money. If the money's still there for Suarez, he'll be in the 41 in 2020. If the money has dried up even just a little bit, perhaps, I think that opens the door for Cole Custer to go to that 41 next year. I hope Cole Custer, nothing against Daniel Suarez. Like I said, he's been a disappointment in the Cup Series. That's no doubt. The stats speak for themselves. That's not a subjective claim. That is an objective claim. Suarez has been a disappointment in the Cup Series. But I still really like Daniel Suarez as a person. I think he can still grow into a contender. I think the potential is there, and I think he gets a little closer every year. I think every year he's been in the Cup Series, he's gotten just a little bit closer. He's just growing a lot too slowly. He's just growing too slowly for a Stuart Haas racing team to deal with. I think Suarez would be great in a front row motorsports car, honestly, because I want to see him in the Cup Series. I think he's the type of guy who could have a couple surprising performances a year, be a great story, but he does not deserve a Stuart Haas racing car. So I hope Cole Custer gets that 41 because that would be an epic rookie battle next year. You're going to have Redick, you're going to have Christopher Bell, and Cole Custer. If you get Custer in that 41, three of the top guys in the Xfinity Series right now all duking it out for Rookie of the Year, that would be actually very entertaining. But I don't know if it's going to happen. If you ask me, I still think Suarez will probably end up in that 41 car, but the reason this report about Corey LaJoy is interesting is maybe that is going to put more pressure on the 41, on that whole situation over there, because for a while it sounded like Custer might be a candidate for that 32. He still might be, but now it sounds a little more likely that LaJoy will stay there, which means Custer only final shot to make it to the Cup Series is in that 41. And that puts more pressure on Suarez and that whole situation. But that's all I really have to talk about there. No other you know, reports, just rumors, just speculation here. But it's an interesting scenario. And I think we may not find out who's going to be driving that 41 car until 2020. It might not be until January 10th, like it was this last year, until we find out who's in that 41. It could be something crazy like that. Hopefully we find out a lot sooner than that. But We'll have to wait and see on that one. Thanks everyone for watching. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. We just hit 98,000 subscribers. This much closer to 100K. It's a slow but steady grind up to the top there. Uh, that's incredible. We're so close to that milestone. Can't thank all of you enough who watch and who support and who subscribe. It means a ton to me. And a special thank you to my Patreon supporters, of course. Michael Harrison, at you as the stars. Cameron James, John Copeland, Jason Arlong, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Denson, Mika Suzuki, iFancyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Kulopoulos, Pepe Lucius, Jeremy Conkley, Emilio Garcia, Joey DiMaccino, Bryce Schumacher, Scott McNew, Colton Austin, Bradley Pelletier, and the rest of these incredible Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this without the support I get from each and every single one of you every single week. So thank you. Thank you for your continued support of Out of the Crew. And a big thank you again to Forney for sponsoring the show, sponsoring this episode. Couldn't do this without their support as well. Ton of awesome people supporting the show over here, helping this thing grow more and more. I'm really excited for 2020. This year is kind of winding down on kind of a weird note. I've just been all over the place. It's been hard for me to upload regularly. But 2020, when that rolls around, especially by the summer of 2020, oh boy. We're going to be going all in on this thing. This is going to be super fun. So I can't thank all of you who support the channel enough. So close to 100K. Can't wait to reach it. That will be, that'll be a dream come true. So thanks for the support, everyone. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Bye-bye, everyone.